All right, so what I wanted to do today was to discuss where we're at with diagnostic tests for HIV with the focus specifically on the tests that are recommended in the CDC uh, APHL recommendations. So to begin with, in 2014, many of you are probably aware of this, the CDC and the Associated Public Health Laboratories developed a new HIV diagnostic algorithm, which I think almost all of you are now seeing infiltrated into what you're using for your clinical practice and that are being mandated by your laboratories. Just to briefly review, the upshot of these recommendations were to initiate HIV testing with an HIV-1-2 fourth generation antigen antibody immunoassay. And this was really a departure from our older third generation and rapid tests that were predominantly used that were second and third generation immunoassays. Another major departure was the recommendation to use an HIV-1-2 antibody differentiation immunoassay for anyone that had a positive test. If you were positive with your initial fourth generation, you went down the pathway of getting a differentiation immunoassay. And the purpose of that assay is to tell you, do you have HIV-1 or 2 or both? And then the final test in this process is the nucleic acid testing as a confirmatory test and also as a tiebreaker when you have a positive initial immunoassay and then a negative or indeterminate uh, differentiation assay, and that was the purpose for using the nucleic acid testing. So that's really the framework of where most laboratories are now. I think many of you are now familiar with this. There's some nuances to this. One of the nuances that I'll be discussing is the new differentiation assay. The Genius test is a departure from what we used in the past and has created some confusion because it behaves a lot more like a Western blot. So to begin with, to, to understand the principles behind the fourth generation antigen antibody test, let me go over a couple of points and then emphasize there are several different fourth generation HIV antigen antibody tests and they are not all the same in terms of what they can differentiate and information that they tell you. The basic concept of this is that you're really trying to detect does the person who you are testing have circulating HIV P24 antigen and or does, does the host have circulating antibodies that are HIV antibodies that have responded to essentially any of the key HIV antigens. Uh, just to refresh your memory, the P24 antigen is derived from the viral core or the capsid, which is a synonymous name for this, and the P24 antigen is this lattice-like structure that makes up the, the core of the virus that contains essentially the components of the HIV single-stranded RNA, contains a lot of the reverse transcriptase enzymes, a lot of the integrase enzymes, although some of those are out in the cytoplasm of the virus as well. So specifically what this test does is that it is a test that has a HIV P24 capture antibody. Its goal here is to capture circulating P24 antigen in the patient sample, but it also has these HIV 1 and 2 recombinant proteins. And I should emphasize that the capture antibody is only capturing HIV 1 P24 antigen. Uh, these are capturing HIV 1 or two. And this is the essentially the upshot for the predominant blood-based tests that we, we are using. The actual rapid testing that's used now that's the fourth generation has specific antigen recombinant proteins that can differentiate whether or not it's one or two, but I'll come back to that. So when you obtain the patient sample, the question you're really asking is, do they have either circulating P24 antigen or HIV antibody, and will that trip the test as positive? If they do, in this particular example, I'm showing you they have both P24 antigen and circulating HIV antibody, and it can be IgM and or IgM. Uh, this will trip the test positive, and the basic concept of this is that the well or the test that's being used just flips as a positive, and it doesn't tell you why it turned positive doesn't tell you if it's the P24 antigen that tripped it or if it's the antibodies that trip it. 
uh, and I will go over the rapid test, which actually does differentiate. Here are the three major tests that are used that are the fourth generation. The ones that are used in your laboratory when you send off a blood sample um, are either the architect or the GS combo. And with both of these, you cannot differentiate what trips the test as positive. So the idea is that these detect P24 antigen and antibodies to HIV 1 or 2. They do not distinguish between HIV antibody 1 or HIV 2 antibody. And only the, the last one, which is the rapid test, the allele, can distinguish P24 antigen from the antibody tripping the test. But notice, though, that the allele does do a fairly good job of distinguishing whether or not it's antigen or antibody that's tripping the test. And this comes up to be relevant if you're really trying to get a sense, does the person have acute HIV? This test reduces the window period, the seroconversion window period, by about 10 to 15 days, and it detects about 60 to 80 percent of persons with acute HIV. It is not a perfect test for detecting everyone with acute HIV, but it is significantly better than the old third generation uh, HIV antibody test. Now, the differentiation test, the HIV-1, HIV-2 differentiation test that we are now using in most laboratories is called the Genius test. The reason most people are using it is the same company that makes Genius, makes the multi-spot, and the company has replaced the multi-spot with the genius. Now, in some places, you may still be doing the multi-spot if they had back-ordered or stockpiled laboratory testing for that with the multi-spot, but in general, all new orders and most laboratories convert it over to the genius. The genius is a much more complicated test. The multi-spot, essentially, you dropped samples on four spots. This is one performed in the laboratory with sophisticated algorithm testing and involves technology. Uh, it's a much more complicated but much more sensitive test, but with that comes some confusing results. So the idea behind the genius is in some ways this is like a Western blot on a cassette. It has the ability to detect HIV-1 and HIV-2. As you can see here, the HIV-2 bands that are picked up are the GP36, GP140. The HIV-1 bands that are picked up are the P31, the GP160, the P24, and the GP41. So it is a broad test. It is not as broad individually as either an HIV-1 Western blot or an HIV-2 Western blot, but overall this test uh, as a combined assay has, has a fair, uh, fairly broad ability to detect both HIV-1 and HIV-2. And there's also a control uh, sample that's run on this as well too. This is to show you conceptually what a Western traditional Western block looks like and where we derive the bands on the Western blot. And I'm showing you this to give you a little bit of an insight into the a genius test and how it does resemble a Western blot. So, you know, what we're used to seeing when you pull out a Western blot and look at it in the laboratory or this to your far right are these multiple bands that you see that really represent different parts of the virus or, or different enzymes of the virus. So what I've done here is to just break this out and show you the envelope, uh, which are the glycoprotein spikes on the surface of the virus, are made up of the precursor GP160 and then the external GP120 or the transmembrane protein GP41. These are shown in blue here where they would show up positive on a Western blot. When you run a real Western blot, you don't get these different colors. I'm just doing this conceptually. You just get all essentially gray, different shades of gray or, or dark and sort of not quite so crystal clear. And, and the bands are usually a little bit more blurry. Uh, the polymerase region you can pick up the bands for the P66, which is essentially the top half of the, of the reverse transcriptase enzyme. You can pick up the bottom half of the reverse transcriptase enzyme, which is, G, uh, which is P31. And you can also pick up this endonuclease uh, protein, or P31. These are shown in the brown bands here. Now, the GAG, which is a, a, a polyprotein that is synthesized and then chopped up into multiple different components, both structurally and enzy enzymatic, especially when you get the gag Paul precursor. But these are the precursor P55, and then, as we mentioned earlier, the P24 protein, um, or P24 antigen, the, the matrix 
the P17 matrix and the uh, nucleocapsid precursor P15. And these are shown here in purple. So there is an origin and, and a logic to where these bands come from as either structural components of the virus, such as the envelope region, or, um, and for example, the matrix and the P24, or enzymatic, like the reverse transcriptase out of the Paul region. This is why I showed that before, is to contrast this with the genius. And you can see here that the genius picks up different components of the virus. It picks up a couple structural components of the envelope. It picks up the endonuclease, and it picks up the P24 core antigen. You, you can also see here that the GP140 and the GP36 for, for HIV-2. So these components do match up uh, with what's seen on the bands on the strips, and it does match up with certain components of a Western blot. And, and I know we've had this discussion before, but the idea is that this is somewhat like a Western blot, and it is definitely different than the older test that we used to use for, for differentiation with the multi-spot. Here's where it gets complicated. There's a software that's involved in this that interprets the patient sample and there is great sensitivity in this, but based on the number of bands that can pop up, you can get, as seen in the red underline, a number of indeterminate results. And for clinicians in our group, this is probably the most confusing thing that you've seen in your practice in terms of testing recently or coming up with these indeterminate results, and it's because of the genius assay now being used, which brings us back in some ways more like a Western blot where we used to get more indeterminate results. So some of the specific test results that we are getting now that we used not to get is a HIV positive, HIV2 positive with HIV1 cross reactivity. That's confusing. You can get an HIV2 indeterminate and you can get an HIV1 indeterminate as well. So the last point to mention is just the timing of when these tests turn positive. And one of the things that uh, many of you have probably seen is this FIBA classification system, which was derived years ago, published about almost 15 years ago, where in a very uh, orderly fashion, these investigators laid out these six different stages uh, and the eclipse phase following the initial HIV infection based on running a number of samples and, and the idea behind this FIBA classification is, is that there is typically an orderly progression when these laboratory tests turn positive. You know, for example, as shown here, the eclipse phase, which is when the RNA is negative until it turns positive. That's typically about 11 days. That's when essentially everything is negative, but the person's infected. Then you can get the initial HIV RNA test turning positive anywhere, you know, from 5 to 11 days. And then there's an orderly sequence of when you typically get things turning positive, such as the P24 antigen, and then different components of antibodies that turn positive. This is a little bit more schematic and easier to understand the progression that you typically see in this FIBA classification. Again, with the eclipse phase typically running anywhere from about 8 to 15 or 16 days, on average about 10 to 11 days, and then subsequently a cascade of, of typical laboratory positivity that turns after that. And, and notice in this, really if you look to the far right, you can see the western blot is really far inferior for detecting persons in the acute phase of HIV. And because some of the proteins in the Western blot will turn positive, some of the bands, this is where you often get indeterminate results with Western blots or people who are in the process of seroconverting. Just to also schematically show you a couple of these definitions and concepts, the eclipse phase, just to reiterate, is the time period between infection from when the laboratory will detect HIV RNA. And again, this is uh, on average approximately 10 days. It can range you know, anywhere from 8, 17 days, even more range than that, but typically about 10 days for the eclipse phase. The seroconversion window period is the period that's referred to as the time between infection and when you have detectable HIV antibodies. And this is significantly longer than, eclip than the eclipse phase, typically about two weeks after the eclipse phase before you uh, essentially close down that seroconversion window period. This is also schematically just laying this out in terms of the key three tests that we're used to ordering, the, the HIV RNA, an antibody test, and a P24 antigen. And you can see from the schematic, the sequence of this is the HIV RNA turns positive first after acquisition, 
then the P24 antigen, and then the HIV antibody. And depending on which HIV antibody test is used with the newer generation, uh, third generations, uh, this is typically, again, about 24, 25 days. And notice that the P24 antigen is better. It's significantly better, but it does not give you the same uh, sensitivity for detecting very early HIV infection as you get with an HIV RNA test. This schematically, I think, helps illustrate a little bit better specificity for drilling down on some of the different tests. The blue bar here is the HIV RNA turning positive anywhere from around 10 days, as we mentioned, following the eclipse phase. This is important to look at the P24 antigen tests that are out there. And again, there's the laboratory-based fourth generations that are the architect and the combo that turn positive usually about halfway between or 17, 18 days after infection. But the rapid test, which does differentiate antigen from antibody, is usually lagging about three to five days after the laboratory-based test. Many of you who are familiar with the Allier fourth generation rapid test, it is an excellent test, but note that it, there is some sensitivity issues in terms of detecting people with acute HIV compared with the laboratory-based test. And then you move into the third generation test. The laboratory, you know, as we as I just mentioned, is about 24 days or so, somewhere in this range. But also notice when you go to more of the rapid third generation testing, things like Orquick and some of the other rapid tests, you drop off sensitivity for detecting early infection in that regard. And again, all of these are going to be better than the sensitivity for detecting a Western blot. Let me go ahead and stop there and see if there's questions. What I tried to do is essentially give a quick overview of where we're at with the CDC recommended guidelines that, that do recommend now using a fourth generation antigen antibody test as our screening test, followed by differentiation assay. Tried to tease through both of these tests and, and go over the timing of that. So let me go ahead and stop there.